Welcome to Art Is. Today we're going to take you on a trip to South Florida to explore the artist mecca Miami. On today's show we will tour the Lowe's Museum with its wonderful collection of Renaissance and Baroque paintings. You will also see Native American, Pre-Columbian and African textiles. And we will also see a wonderful collection of ancient Greek pottery, statues and marble busts. Next we will go to the Art Deco District in the heart of Miami Beach to tour the Wilsonian Museum, which is well known for the ongoing exhibition, Art Design in the Modern Age. And we will go to Florida International University's museum to meet nationally recognized Cuban artist, Jose Badilla. On February 22, 1950, the University of Miami opened the doors to the Woes Museum, the first public arts institution in Miami. Over the past 50 years, the museum has gone through a number of expansions to hold over 7,000 objects in its permanent collection. Brian Dursum, the museum director, will take us on a tour of the museum's various collections. In the, um, the original buildings, which include uh, the 1950 edition, um, the 1953, 56, and 61 editions, we have housed in those areas really the permanent collection which includes, and it takes you through a panoramic um, view of world history, world art history. It takes you through the uh, Greco-Roman world. It takes you into Renaissance and Baroque, which is the gallery we're currently standing in. It takes you into um, 18th through early 20th century, which is a gallery that we rotate once a year. Uh, then through African, Asian, pre-Columbian, Native American, and then if you go into the new wings, you get into 20th century American, which is part of the permanent collection, as well as two galleries which we use for traveling exhibitions, exhibitions which will rotate every six to eight weeks. Well, the Renaissance collection was actually a gift to the nation in the 1950s. It was made as a national distribution by the Crest family, a Crest family foundation out of the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., the Lowe got 41 paintings in sculpture in 1954. The actual transfer of the gift didn't occur until 1961 when this gallery was built to house it. Um, I have added actually works, another 19 works that were donated to the museum by other contributors in the Miami area uh, to that collection. And um, it's a wonderful collection, a great resource of Italian Renaissance and Baroque painting. It also includes a small collection of Northern European, Northern Renaissance material from roughly the same period. Well, the Renaissance, as you're probably aware, is really, um, literally means rebirth. Uh, and it really was a rebirth of uh, going back to classical roots and classical, you know, Greco-Roman uh, antiquities and roots, discovering that whole uh, area again. Uh, and um, it's found in many of the paintings. The paintings before tended to be rather flat to a certain extent in the medieval period. Uh, in the Renaissance, you begin to get into the whole issue of color, uh, light, uh, perspective, the whole notion of um, trying to create out of a two-dimensional work some three-dimensional um, movement to the, to the work that uh, didn't really exist before. Uh, in the portrait collection, we really uh, have highlighted uh, paintings that s sort of follow after this, that come into the, actually into the late Baroque and, and beyond that, this, the 18th century, 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. And of course, if you look at the portraits, they change a great deal. Um, in the Renaissance, there is still a certain amount of religious um, use for the painting. For example, as a painting in this gallery, which actually shows the donors um, of the painting. They're in, in a tiny position vis-a-vis -vis the painting, but they're there. They're actually portraits are actually in the painting. In the other gallery, you see uh, large paintings of perhaps one person or perhaps a family and they become the center, really, of the universe. It's no longer, in a sense, the, uh, the church, which is all-inclusive. It's no longer the Virgin Mary, the Christ figure, or whatever. It is now really uh, an issue of a man, of, of just an ordinary person, perhaps, a wealthy ordinary person who is now depicted. And it can also involve a famous general, or perhaps you know, a famous admiral, or whatever, a king, a queen. 
Uh, and this was something that um, you did find in the Renaissance, but it became increasingly more and more apparent as you move further away from the Renaissance. That collection actually is the earliest and probably the first collection of non-Western art that came to this museum. Uh, in 1956, Alfred Barton, who was uh, a resident of Miami and one of the founders of this museum in 1950, um, approached the director and said, I will donate to this museum my collection of Native American textiles. He, he collected specifically Navajo and Southwestern textiles. And um, before he made the gift in 1956, he decided that rather than make a gift of 200 textiles to the museum, um, he would split the collection and he traded with the Denver Art Museum at the time for a number of other artifacts which included um, beaded work, um, basketry, ceramics, and uh, a group of other objects which the museum did not have and which he did not have in his own collection in order to make the collection more diverse. And um, although those pieces are individually very, very fine examples, the collection is still best known for its Barton collection of, na of southwestern native, native textiles, which is very interesting. Pieces in the um, African collection are several that are extremely special. Um, we have costumes, for example. It's a very large textile collection. There's one that sits in the corner, which um, is, at this point, mounted um, in a fashion that it would not have necessarily been mounted on before. It has a flat board across the top of it. This board would have been worn on the head and the dancer would literally have uh, twirled around. It looked very much like a whirling dervish, in a sense, with all these flaps of, of color sort of spinning out. There, were no, there was no mask on the top of the head. The whole um, vestment, in a sense, the whole costume itself was mask and costume together. The other pieces that are extremely interesting out there is a piece we just acquired um, from the Nok culture. And um, ceramics are, are little known in Africa, at least in most uh, visitors to museums don't expect to find uh, really high quality ceramics from the continent of Africa. And in fact, they were producing very, very fine ceramic, ceramic sculpture, ceramic pots uh, from a fairly early period of time, from at least the third century BC that we know about. And um, the particular figure that I'm referring to as a knock figure was probably um, a may have been a portrait figure, we don't know. Its, its arms and its feet are missing, but it's uh, fairly complete uh, as those figures go. They tended to be fairly low fired, and so the breakage and damage from them is, is fairly frequent. The other piece, which is very interesting, and again an area that most um, Westerners may not, may not realize that the Africans did practice in, was in, uh, it was in bronze casting. They actually had a, a bronze casting system that they used and there's a wonderful ring out there from the Yoruba culture uh, depicting ritual decapitation. Most people may know about Benin bronzes. There are Benin bronze heads of Obas who were chiefs that uh, were made as memorial portraits. And uh, these were placed in the shrines and um, you know, numbers of them have been, have been documented and collected. Actually, if you want to look at the museum from the point of view of a medium, the uh, most impressive medium that we have in terms of cross-cultural and perhaps more universal, if you want to use it that way, are the ceramic collection and the textile collection, which seem to cut across any number of continents and any number of cultures. Um, the ceramic collection is extremely large. It, um, it includes material, for example, from China, which has a very early pot, you know, pottery-making tradition, and we have a small show which shows the history of pottery from original coil-built pottery, where everyone did that as a child. You rolled out a roll of clay and then you coiled it until you made a pot and then you smoothed it with your hands to get it flat. Um, and then from that, of course, you went into a wheel turned uh, pottery type and mold made and all different types of potteries. And you know, then you also get into a whole history of decoration. First, pro probably would just be some kind of mineral paint, which is exemplified in a number of African pieces as well as on uh, Native American pieces and also very early Chinese pieces. Then you get ultimately into glazes, which or you don't find really on um, Native American pottery or pre-Columbian or any of that.
Well, actually, the low um, is fairly technologically advanced for its, for its age and its budget. We have a, a website on uh, which everything is cataloged, actually, the, um, in terms of our exhibitions from the past. So we have an archive on that, and also our future exhibitions and programming is all on that website. And the website address is actually very simple. It's www.lowmuseum.org, with the Low Museum being one word. And so it's very readily available. We'll be right back with more from the Wolfsonian Museum in North Miami. suddenly occurs to you that you need to make a call, only Bell South Mobility works when and where you need it. Potowitz. Mr. Hanson? Is that Hanson? I need to talk to Hanson. Mr. Hanson, can you hold on, please? Bell South Mobility. Life's calling. Why wait? When natural gas is on, it's on. When it's off, it's off. When it's dinner time in your home, wouldn't you really rather have the precise cooking control of natural gas on your side? Choose natural gas cooking when you're serious about dinner. Mobile chefs do. Clean burning natural gas, still South Alabama's best energy value. From Mobile Gas and Energy South Company. Why the why? For a healthy body for a lifetime. Why the why? For fun and fitness for the kids. Why the why? Uh, for personal attention with programs that fit your lifestyle. With five locations, low monthly membership fees, summer day camp, brand new and renovated facilities, why not the Y? Call now for YMCA enrollment at... Under the Oaks in Old Spring Hill at Holiday Incorporated, you'll find finery for all ages, infants, children, preteens, and ladies. For special occasions, bridesmaids, mother of the bride, flower girls, and ring bearers. The holiday also carries sportswear and accessories for any occasion. Come by and experience for yourself the friendly personnel and surprisingly affordable prices at Holiday Incorporated at 4513 Old Shell Road. In 1996, the exhibition Art and Design in the Modern Age was unveiled with over 300 objects predominantly from Europe and North America. Providing rich cultural, political, and technological changes that revolutionized the world from 1885 to 1945, preceding World War II. The collection reflects the material culture of democracy, capitalism, socialism, communism, Nazism, and fascism. Wolfsonian uh, was established by Mitchell Wolfson Jr., a collector from Miami, um, who put together this enormous collection, which is now uh, over 70,000 objects. And the objects include everything from decorative arts, like furniture and ceramics and glass, to political arts, including posters, paintings, uh, maquettes, which are models for architectural monuments that might have had political themes, and all kinds of design and technological um, objects from telephones and typewriters to radios. So it, it's quite an eclectic collection, but it's all collected within the period of about 1880 um, to 1945. So he was particularly interested in the period right after the Industrial Revolution in the mid-19th century and how this new, what is generally termed the machine age, how this new age of the machine and technology affected um, the people who were living in this period of time. So those are the issues that we try to discuss when we look at objects, um, not only to look at an object for its aesthetic qualities, but also to look at it for what it tells us about the political, historical, and economic um, period in which it was made. Um, since we are located in, in South Florida, which is a big tourist destination and also um, demographically has a lot of retirees in South Florida. A lot of the collections from the um, mid-20th century, things that date from the period of World War II, for example, we often get really positive feedback 
from people who lived during this period of time. And they're really surprised to see that we've collected um, both important objects and also everyday objects, things like um, tickets to world's fairs or little souvenirs. And I often hear some of, of the folks who visit us say, oh God, I remember when I went to the 1939 World's Fair in New York and I have one of those uh, Goodyear tire um, souvenirs or things like that. So it is, um, it is a positive reinforcement that people enjoy seeing some of these things. And on the other hand, we try to have put together a collection that deals with historical issues in a very um, even way in the sense that we show fascist materials as well as um, things produced in, uh, in a democratic country like America. And we try to show how imagery um, that is used in propaganda is used, same kinds of images are used um, throughout the world so that a figure like an eagle, which is a symbol of might and a symbol of, um, of power, is something that was used in fascist Italy, was used in Nazi Germany, and of course is used in American iconography. So it's not the imagery that is what tells us the story, but it's, it's delving into the history of these nations and understanding what brought these um, products or um, propaganda designs into being, and that's what we try to do here. We hope that people leave the Wolfsonian understanding a little bit more about the past, but taking that with them so that they understand the period of time in which we're living and are able to better discern uh, propaganda objects, uh, advertising design, and how all of these things affect um, our psyches too. Next on Art Is, we'll take you to FIU's Art Museum to meet Cuban artist Jose Vidia. Treat yourself to a visit to Allentown Custom Frame Shop and Gallery. Finishing touches for your home or office, memories from years gone by, gifts for friends and co-workers, or a special gift for yourself. Allentown offers a wide selection of frames and mats. Allentown Custom Frame Shop and Gallery, 2039 Airport Boulevard in Mobile at the Loop. To plan your one-of-kind framing, call Allentown at 334-479-1199. Under the Oaks in Old Spring Hill at Holiday Incorporated, you'll find finery for all ages, infants, children, preteens, and ladies. For special occasions, bridesmaids, mother of the bride, flower girls, and ring bearers. The Holiday also carries sportswear and accessories for any occasion. Come by and experience for yourself the friendly personnel and surprisingly affordable prices at Holiday Incorporated at 4513 Old Shell Road. 
Woven Treasures is the finest oriental rug store in the southeast with over 3,000 finely hand-woven collectible antique Persian, European, and decorative oriental rugs on display. Remember, at Woven Treasures, you will receive the best service, such as professional repair and cleaning, a certificate of authenticity, and appraisal for your insurance purposes with replacement value. Woven Treasures in the Loop at 1858 Airport Boulevard in Mobile. Hi, this is Jimmy Green of Susie Redmond. We've got a great deal for you from the American Cancer Society. We are introducing the 1999 Golf Pass at a great price of $25. With this, you are able to play over 145 courses along the Gulf Coast with a discounted or free green fees. So call and get your pass, and if you buy three, you get the fourth one free. 1-800-480-GOLF. And join Jimmy and I and tee off against cancer. When natural gas is on, it's on. When it's off, it's off. When it's dinner time in your home, wouldn't you really rather have the precise cooking control of natural gas on your side? Choose natural gas cooking when you're serious about dinner. Mobile chefs do. Clean burning natural gas, still South Alabama's best energy value. From Mobile Gas and Energy South Company. Under the oaks in Old Spring Hill at the Holiday Place, you'll find a charming shopping village with a variety of specialty shops. Holiday Incorporated has finery for all ages, infants, children, preteens, and ladies. For special occasions, bridesmaids, mother of the bride, flower girls, and ring bearers. Holiday also carries sportswear, swimwear, and accessories for any occasion. The pavilion has a wide selection of pewter ware, delicate crystal, fine china, and exquisite gifts for the home. Come by and experience for yourself the friendly personnel and surprisingly affordable prices at Holiday Place at 4513 Old Shell Road. Jose Padilla is a talented painter who draws from his life experiences in Cuba as an inspiration for his paintings. Through his paintings, Jose can transport you into the mind of an individual who has experienced the unrelenting power of domination through communism. Like the ideas in me, mostly from the, 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 myth, the, myth, the mythological tradition from Cuba, the myth from the, also from the Native American, my own experience, um, and also some visionary things what I have one at a time. And I try to combine all these things together. He's a, like, he looks like a, a homeless. He has um, the, the skin, mostly he has problem with the skin. And the laying, his representation is like a guy who has lepro or something like that. But in the same way, when he looks so poor, and he, have, he living in the street, and he dressing so pure, he's so powerful. So the people in Cuba respect so much this image. That's why the people also respect too much the homeless in my culture, in, my, in Cuba. Nobody refuses to give them a little coin for a homeless in the street because they suppose maybe San Lazarus is behind that simple guy, you know. Well, that painting is referring to the, the feeling of loneliness, you know. The title is Isla Sola, or Lonely Island. And he's referring about a guy who tried to uh, uh, left the island, but in the same, in the same time he tried to survive in the island because his he ch ship was sinking. It's, it's a ship break, and he's a survivor of the disaster. So in some way he had to uh, recuperate that landscape and incorporate in him. So that the island, the whole wood in the island, representing like a big head, but also representing like a, a huge labyrinth. Is the is the guy in some ways my own portrait? It's, it's a utopic self portrait. If if I someday I have the chance to go back to my country, to my neighborhood, to visit my parents, because my father and mother remain there in Cuba. So I, this is my vision of the street, and it's like a a little tiny guy in the middle of the street cafe with luggage for present to his family. So it, that's why that painting is very important for me. In some ways, like uh, to express myself and communicate a feeling to other people, you know, um, because I select 
this media, you know, the, the visual art. I think the, the best thing what I can do, you know, in, in, and when the people come to me and they discover symbol behind my painting and they talk about that, I, I feel very satisfied, you know. But, and this is the, the best thing what you can do. When you, your dream is to communicate this at the most quantity of people is possible. Miami is really a new city. Miami, by the way, is an Indian word meaning sweet water. And of course, Miami Beach is a separate city. And the two uh, uh, communities come together to celebrate the arts. And I think you, I see that there are many, many people that are involved specifically in, um, an, in a particular medium that might be their favorite. Could it be the Philharmonic? Could it be the opera? Could it be ballet? But beyond that, there's a full range of interest in the community where people attend so many different things. It's just so exciting to see uh, uh, the crowds uh, attending, uh, theater openings, uh, museum openings, uh, the opera. The opera is 54 years old, and by most standards, New York standards, it's a young company. But for us, it's one of the oldest cultural institutions here in Florida. So we have a diverse community and, the, and, and a wonderful uh, uh, group of people that support uh, the arts. The process of just creating tropiculture.com, which will be an overview of all of the arts and culture and a calendar of events, and we will hyperlink with all of our partner organizations so that anyone around the world can find out more about arts and culture here in Miami. Additionally, um, the convention in the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau has a site, uh, uh, miami.com where anyone can find out other kinds of information relating to travel and tourist information. So I think in the, in the next few months, uh, anyone in the world will be able to access current information about our arts and culture. We hope you enjoyed our trip to South Florida. If you have any suggestions for where you think Art Is should take you next, give Art Is a call at 334-476-9773 or email us at artistv at zebra.net. Join us next week as we continue our journey into the world of the arts. Thank <laughs> you.